very good evening and a warm welcome to the program. Thank you for joining us. Um, tonight on the show, we'll be speaking about epilepsy, the pandemic, and mental health. Epilepsy is a tough condition to contend with. You now, throw in a pandemic and you could cause despair. Perhaps the redeeming phrase here um, from our conversation is going to be that we'll also speak about mental health. If we take care of our mental health, we prevail over the difficulties that life throws at us. So taking care of our mental health will be our closer so that we can end on a high positive note for our viewers. Um, my panelists today, uh, Nina Mago is the founder of Papo Bench Initiative. Nina, thank you for, for joining us and for accepting my invitation on short notice. Thank you, Nina. And also we have Maurice Osiri, who is the university counselor at Clark International University. Maurice, thank you so much for joining us. And to start really just to get a sense of, uh, Maurice, what is it like being a counselor at a university? I, I know that for, for many schools, we've had this conversation before with different people on the show, that schools don't have counselors and we know that there are mental health um, challenges that are there for university students and even just other students. What is it like being a counselor at a university? Do you find that students just, you know, easily accept this and, and come to actually seek you out and speak to you about, about things? What is it like? All right, thanks, Josephine. Thanks for having me. Uh, being a university counselor, it feels different compared to the usual clinic practice. The issue here is that most students, one, they could be a bit hesitant to seek out for the service. Two, most of them see that you're with them always, so they may not entirely feel so free to share with you because they see you like on a daily at the, at the university. However, there are those who, when need be, who really seek out. And uh, in my time as a university counselor, I've realized that oftentimes it's beginning of semester with the fresh students, that's when they will seek out for help. Then towards examination time, is when they also seek out, mainly for finalists. I think there's a lot of uh, exam-related anxiety and tension that comes through. So that's the time when students usually seek out. Then I've also had moments when a student will come to you, then he or she will tell you, I need help, but can you get for me someone outside the university? What is it like now with the lockdown? You unable to move, the students unable to move. Um, do, you, do you get them calling you? Um, what is your role at this point in time, especially knowing how a lot of people have been affected by the pandemic and by the lockdown? How are you supporting them? Yeah, um, one thing is also that, that I need to highlight is that some of our students have also got exposed being a, a medical related institution. We've had students at the front line who have gotten exposed. Some have reached out like after recovery and they reach out informing you that I've been struggling with APC, how can I, you know, pick up? And um, those who are able to reach out, some just call you up, others probably send you an email. Then there are those who can prefer like a WhatsApp call, you know, a WhatsApp video call. So you can have uh, a brief session with them because sometimes when someone reaches out, it's possible that it's just one or two things that they really want to, you know, to talk about. So giving them audience has been the best thing I can do. The fact that movements are limited, so they cannot come to the university, neither can I. So as we can utilize as much time as possible on mid or, or I mean online. That's what that's how I'm supporting them. Uh, Nina, you've been quiet, um, no fault of yours, but I, I, it's been a while since we, we, we were on the show with you speaking about um, the issues that you champion. And I, I wanted to know how, how you've been, but also how the Purple Bench Initiative has been faring since we last spoke. Thank you, Josephine. It has really been a while since we last spoke, um, but I have personally been well and the Purple Bench has also been well. We brought on board Morris, so he's been a great help to all the people living with epilepsy that we are dealing with, especially in Kampala. And um, it's been a process of growth, if I should say. So since we last spoke, we've gotten, the, we've gotten awards, including um, the Golden Light Award, that was given to me personally, and then the Amanda Award that was given to the organization for the work we're doing regarding epilepsy work in our communities. And we have become a chapter of 
the IBE, which is the International Bureau for Epilepsy. And most recently, I have been invited to be a part of AREC, which is a regional representation body of the IBE in Africa. So it's been growth. And it's, it's great to hear um, how far you've come, Nina. Um, we're going to play um, a clip of um, our last interview with you, Nina, where you, you shared a bit of your story. Uh, and I think it will mm-hmm. give an insight into um, what we're talking about so that somebody who is just joining us for this conversation for the first time um, can come along with that. When did you first get the impression that, you know, there was a seizures happening <clears throat> or something was amiss? Well, funny enough, it's like going through or growing up, I knew that there was always something wrong. And that's why I would always run up to my mom, my dad or whoever was around. But we never talked much about it. So I was left to kind of wonder what it was that was going on. And usually when you get a seizure anyway, you're not cautious of what is happening. Mm -hmm. So all the conversations surrounding that condition would be there while you're asleep. So when you get up, you know, it's the normal life. And then everyone is back to what they're doing. But the first time I actually got to notice something of that kind, or to see someone who ever had a seizure, was in my S4. What did you see? Um, I saw a girl who just kind of pushed away the table and got really stiff and fell to the floor. And at that point, everyone was running. And so did I. You also <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I also read. That was the very first time I saw someone. But at that same time, I still didn't know that that is what was happening to me anyway. But I do remember one thing in particular is um, going back home and telling my dad about what had happened. And his reaction, his glassy eyes, and he said, what did you do when this happened to this girl? And I said, I ran, like all the other kids. And he kind of turned away and walked off while he was talking to me. And it was only later that I noticed why he reacted that way and said, oh my God, he had been seeing this all my life, literally. Yes, it is uh, a problem in the brain. Uh, The brain is like any electrical appliance and it sends out electricity, as I like, that's how I, uh, I explain it. Sends out electricity in an orderly fashion, and that's how we move, that's how we, we coordinate things. Those are what we call impulses. Now, if you have any area in the brain which doesn't coordinate with the rest, then you get a spark, and that spark is what you see as a seizure. Now, it becomes very difficult when we combine that with uh, discussing witchcraft and the, <laughs> the, the metaphysical because the, you know for medicine we know that seizures are a medical condition which require treatment and actually when you do treat uh, somebody who gets seizures they get controlled we don't talk about them getting better because it's long-term treatments like blood sugar like high blood pressure but actually you get control <coughs> you have your medicine you take it well you live your life normally. All right. Um, so what, what is the prevalence in the society today? For example, Uganda with, what, over 45 million people. How many people um, do, do we have any figures? Do we have any research that has been done that you can share with us, Nina, from, from you know, the work that you're doing? Um, generally, if I'm looking globally for starters, We are looking at over 50 million people who are living with this condition. But when it comes down to Uganda in particular, we have some preliminary studies that have been done globally by um, some organizations that we relate with. But the preliminary studies kind of show that we are looking at about six people in every 1,000 at the moment. I mean, it it looks like a, a a small number, uh, six in 1,000 compared to other, you know, conditions. Would you think that's one of the reasons why it's not given as much attention as other conditions? 
Um, I actually think there's a lot more that goes into why epilepsy is not looked at so critically like other conditions are. And I think one of those reasons would be the fact that it has so much stigma. And because of that, no one really wants to talk about it or even bring it up. So it takes a lot of um, information to be able to bring it to, you know, to the table for people to have a discussion over it. Maurice, what's, what's been your experience um, with people living with epilepsy when they come to you? Do, do they come voluntarily? Does somebody recommend them? And when they come, is it the situation you're speaking about with Nina when we talk about stigma? What is it like? Yes, oftentimes those who come to me, some are referred, then some actually just call you up and they would like to have an appointment, which to me is a good thing when someone reaches out without being even uh, referred. But oftentimes when they come, most of them present with uh, depressive related symptoms or depression. Others also present with some anxiety related issues. Then of course, stigma always features in. People, they report of how probably community, in, by community meaning uh, workplace, uh, some of them, uh, their peers, or even family, you know, like stigmatize them, they're, they're kept away. Like in a family setting, they wouldn't want them to come out more often or even to, uh, to disclose their status. So some of them, they struggle with that. They feel they're not really, they're not living the life that they would you know, want to live despite having epilepsy. Epilepsy is not contagious, you know, but society views it in a way that they wouldn't want uh, someone with epilepsy just to be out there. So these people, they, they feel that there's like a barrier to them living their normal life. So with that, most of them get withdrawn. Most of them also get issues of much fear and stress, you know, because they're thinking, assuming I get an attack, how am I going to be helped, you know? And because of that, you realize that their mental well-being is affected and with time, they keep deteriorating. That's why most of them actually also report with uh, mainly depression. That's the main thing that they report with. And some actually get suicidal, you know? So there's need for, for, for these patients to, to, to be led to live a normal life. That will actually even help them to, you know, to cope with the, with the condition. But if you, if you keep them away, if you do not give them all the proper attention they need, they begin thinking, is this, is this condition a sentence or what? But if you leave them you know, like to live freely like any other person, it will even encourage them to come out. You know, Because right now, most workplaces, a person could be epileptic, but he or she will not disclose. Because they're not sure what will happen as and when I disclose this, you see? So they'll keep it to themselves. So that's also, so the social stigma influences the self-stigma, you know? So they, they need to, to, to get the community aware, you know? There's a lot of sensitization that is needed in the community so that people who are living with epilepsy are, are considered as any other person in the society. I think it's it's a very it can be a very scary situation um, when you interface with somebody who is having an epileptic attack and, and maybe you don't know how to help them and maybe for them they also might not have um, the vital information that they need. Um, uh, can epilepsy be cured? Does it go away after a time? Can it be managed well enough to allow a person carry on with their everyday duties? The chances of survival, like you said can be high, but there's still a lot to consider because you need to know or would need to know the level at which the person's seizures are at. So how frequent are these seizures? When did they begin? When the, did the person begin medication? There's a lot that we need to look at before we can actually you know, pin the coin and say that this person can live uh, an exceptionally good normal life. But if I'm to speak for myself, I would say you can live a normal life, but there are limitations regardless. Because um, for me personally, I would tell you that 
I would have to take, I have to take my medication every day at the same time. At the same time, I have to get a lot of sleep. I have to make sure that I exercise. At the same time, I really have to manage stress. And you can imagine managing stress is one of the hardest things that anyone you know, can do ideally. But it's something that you have to work on and do on a daily basis. Because if you don't, then you know, you're going to have issues. But if we are to still dig deep into management, there's still a lot that goes with it. Because you know, seizures don't stop just at medication. We're looking at medication. We're look at we're looking at your um, availability of food, for instance. You know, you're supposed to be able to have good nutrition. You're supposed to be well hydrated. You're you know you're supposed to get the exercise that you need. So there are a couple of things that get in there for before a person can say that. Oh my God, we're looking at you know good management, and it's also the degree at which the person's seizures are at. Thank you, Nina. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. Um, uh, I'm here on this call with uh, Nina Mago, who is the founder of Purple Bench Initiative and Maurice Osiri, uh, university counselor at Clark International University. And today we're speaking about epilepsy, the pandemic and mental health. And I, I wanted to, to start from where you stopped off, Nina, with um, the management how good is the medical care for epilepsy in Uganda? Uh, what's it like now and has it improved over time? We're looking at um, holistic sort of care. So we're looking at medication. We're looking at alternative um, therapies. We're looking at options for surgery. You know, we have a couple of things that we're, we're considering. And since epilepsy is such a financially intensive condition, that too has such a significant um, pinch towards getting epilepsy care to where we would have wanted it to be. Um, thanks, Nina. I've, when you were speaking earlier, I was thinking about the situation that we are in, the pandemic, and I was thinking about how somebody with epilepsy is, is, is dealing with all of this. And, um, you know, the news on TV is gloomy. The, when you read the newspapers, it's all gloomy. The restrictions are biting hard. Frustrations are threatening to boil over. And the future is very uncertain for many people. Stress levels are definitely rising. And that's one of the things that you spoke about. Would this trigger epileptic seizures more than usual? Actually, um, one of the biggest triggers or what we probably put at the top is stress. And just like I was telling you earlier, managing stress can be a very hard situation for anyone. So you can imagine what it would be like for a person who has a condition of this kind. Maurice, when you, when you, knowing that stress is a factor, and I know that when we deal with mental health, that's one of the key things that we are speaking about or we are speaking to. How do you come in at this point? How do we give assistance for people with epilepsy to, to get through this period? What would you tell them for people who don't have your number, can't call you, they don't have any other um, counselor's number, they can't call them, they maybe don't even believe in therapy, in, in counseling, but they need this assistance. They know that the stress gets to them and affects them. How do they get support? Okay, uh, it's true that stress oftentimes triggers uh, the seizures. And the best thing to be done is to, to manage the stress. Like we said earlier on that, we can't do our own stress. It's there, but how do we manage it? So each one, each and every one of us has a way of dealing with stress, you know, in their own spaces. But all in all, what people need to do is that to reduce on the amount of stress that a person has, we need to understand what is the, the leading cause of your stress. You know, once you understand that, it, it's easier now to, to, to come up with ways of dealing with it. For example, uh, most people could maybe say, as of now, most people could probably say they have these financial stresses, especially now when it comes to even accessing the medication, they cannot move. So that brings a lot of worry in the person, you know, and of course the stress levels will shoot up and person can develop seizures. So if someone can 
have good social support. By social support, I'm also meaning people can help them maybe even access the medication when need to be. People can help them with an aspect of reassurance whenever the, the, the highly stressed up uh, would also need, much as this is a neurological issue, but some of these people can actually, you know, do engage in some simple exercises to, to deal with the stress levels, probably even if it's indoor games, you know, something to, 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 to get you distracted from this stressing situation that you're going through. You know, so if a person can engage even in, in simple walks, you know, something to, to, to make them feel uh, physically engaged, there's some of the things that a person can do to, to relieve to relieve on the stress levels that they're experiencing. But it's not that we can end this stress, it's there, you know. So we just have to, to learn to live and manage it. Live with it and manage it, that's the best thing to do. Nina, how do you manage your stress, especially in the lockdown? Um, I mean, everybody is stressed. We are told to take walks, uh, Maurice. We are told to to do so many things, but it can be very it can be very difficult um, to do, especially when you're being told to do. Um, there is a feeling of lethargy. There is a feeling of hopelessness. Um, Nina, how how do you help yourself? How do you keep um, on top of it? if at all? So I read quite a bit, but I also engage my creative side. So I'm craftsy, so I make, make crafts. I, I do take walks, like it said, although it can even be a little harder, um, like Morris was saying, because I'm also asthmatic, but I do engage in quite a lot of things. I stay off the news, honestly. I try my best to, to keep that on a low because it does cause a lot of anxiety. Um, I also do gardening and I enjoy that. Oh, you do gardening. I was saying social media is also, I think another trigger for a lot of people um, for stress. Yeah, pe people stay off <laughs> social media to cut the stress. <laughs> Talk about um, uh, movements and the restrictions, and I, I imagine that a lot of specialized medical attention for epilepsy is available in limited spaces. I don't know about that. Maybe you can you, you can let me know if that's right. So patients would have to walk or travel long distances to be able to get this. Um, how are the restrictions affecting them? Have you had any of the people under the Purple Bench Initiative maybe reach out, struggling to to find any kind of support? And, and how are you helping? How, what does help look like? For now, I'm a bit flexible in a way that whichever works for the person, I go by that. The sample who prefer to talk to you on phone, I go by that. Those who prefer a video call, I go by that. Those who can access a clinic, you know, where, where, where I practice, uh, I can still, you know, avail myself of the clinic. But now, still on the issue of restrict happens that sometimes when, uh, they talk of uh, essential staff or medical staff, somehow med mental health practitioners are not looked at. So we have to find a way of getting to the clinic to help someone. Yet actually, mental, the mental health of people is also something vital at this moment, you know? But at least I've made it flexible. Oftentimes I go by what, what is favorable for the client. If they prefer a call, it's all good. If they can access a clinic and uh, I find them there, it's all good. So. Whichever way that favors the person, I'm, I'm flexible to that. One of the questions was for you, Nina, in terms of um, accessing medical treatment, so maybe drugs and, and things. Are those in specialized places? As, are they easy for people to get? And, you know, considering um, the lockdown and the restrictions in movement, what's that been like? Are people uh, finding difficulty under the Purple Bench Initiative? What have you heard? What are they telling you? And what are the solutions there? So um, Josephine, I think I should make it a point to say that people who are taking anti-epilepsy medication have to have this medication on a daily basis for a given period of time. And in the communities that we're working with at the moment, because of the restrictions, people cannot access that medication. And what it means when a person cannot access that medication is that they're going to have more seizures. If anything, it will be even harder for those seizures to be managed. 
because the body does not, the body has been ripped of the medication basically. And even when we actually tried to engage the VHTs, even they were stopped from what we were, we were told. So even them accessing the health center to bring back the medication to the people in the community has been an issue. So a lot of the people who are on these medications are really having a, a terrible time. It's really, it's, it's taking us back from what we had originally, you know, put together, the system we had, we had originally put together to support the people. Thank you, Nina, and thank you, Morris. Let's take a nice short break and we'll be back shortly. Were there um, things you'd, you'd tell someone who has epilepsy not to engage in activities? Uh, epilepsy, yes. even though it is very universal, it's also very individual. Yeah. Um, the things which spark off epilepsy in one person may not necessarily spark off epilepsy in another. So you, you really have to understand your condition. And I think that's one of the things that most likely in Russia you found easier. Yeah. Yeah. Because people will talk to you, make you understand, not to tell you, I think you're sick, this is the medicine, that's go home. Yeah. So you need to understand the condition and understand how it affects you and how you can in, impact it. Two is that, um, let me get where my trend of thought is. So, you need to know how to impact it. That, that, that is, now I've lost my trend of thought. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to come back to that one. Yes, you need to say something? I mean, personally, okay. um, like you said, you kind of need to know how to handle oh, your own case. condition. Mm -hmm. Because some people, some people's seizures are triggered by, let's say the lights, flickering mm -hmm. lights. Some people, it would be a lack of sleep. Some people, it will be a particular wavelength of, you know, sound could easily trigger a seizure. Some people, it's just literally just noise. When a person makes noise, mm. they're going to have a seizure. So there are so many little different things. It could be something you eat. It mm. could be in your diet, that whatever is causing your seizures is actually in your diet. So it has to be very particular. Even when a person has a child who has this condition, Every time you feed, you have to take time to see if anything comes off whatever okay. it is that they eat. Do you know what causes your, your seizures or what used to cause them? What? <laughs> mm -hmm. I would like to think it was more stress because every time I found myself in a situation where I was really sad, then it, it always happened. But at the same time, exactly. when I was really excited, mm -hmm. I remember there was a time in school when I knew what my dad's car sounded like. So he came to school when we were at assembly. And I had his car and I was so excited. The next thing I remember, I was in his car and we were heading home. Because <laughs> I had got a seizure and I was so upset because I kept trying to tell him that I'm sorry that I got us in this situation. But all I could hear was his voice saying, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. We're heading home, it's going to be fine. <laughs> so I need to take on where I had stopped because okay. the, the, it's true that uh, extreme emotion can cause it. Yeah. And she did mention the other triggers. So it's important to know what trigger you have, what will trigger your epilepsy. Mm -hmm. There are things which we discourage though, um, things like contact spots, uh, things like um, very violent movies where there's blasting everywhere and there are lots of flickering of lights. Yeah. We discourage that. And then, of course, you have to, imagine, uh, to be able to manage uh, extreme Emotions. forms of emotion. <laughs> yes. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. We're having a conversation on epilepsy, the pandemic, and mental health. And I have Nina Mago and Maurice Osiri on, 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 on the call. Um, Nina, I've, I've often wondered, every time I'm, I'm driving, especially at night and you know those the, the lights that are attached to the CCTV cameras. So when you drive by, they they flicker, and it's 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 almost blinding. Um, I'll admit that for me, for even a few seconds, I I'm still trying to you know find my bearings. I I've always wondered how that affects you. Yes, I also wonder why the lights, the security lights, flicker. 
there is a population that is actually triggered, whose seizures are triggered by these lights. I happen to be one of those people who won't actually have the seizure, but it really does have a terrible effect on me. And I think that should actually be an opportunity for me to tell you about other seizure triggers that might be very important for people to look out for. And some of those include, we talked about the stress, which is at the, you know, the top of, of, of the list, but exhaustion is actually one of the others. So exhaustion and a lack of sleep at the same time could be a huge seizure trigger. The illnesses, especially those that bring up um, a temperature. So we're looking at things like malaria could also have such a huge effect. Um, women's menstrual cycles can actually be a trigger. There's a population that uh, whose menstrual cycle actually triggers seizures. And at the same time, when you say low blood that, sugar. When you say the menstrual cycle, that means at least in a month, Yes. Anyone who is triggered by the menstrual cycle is going to have a seizure or two or more. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Um, we're also looking at low blood sugar. So this medication that people are taking, you have to eat in time. You have to be well hydrated. So low blood sugar and missing the medication would be a huge trigger for seizures. What can we do to push more for epilepsy to be given the attention that it needs? I think that's, that's a real good one. And one thing, you're, one thing is what you're already doing, you know, media. The community needs to know. People need to know about epilepsy. So thanks for this. Uh, secondly, uh, I'd also want to appreciate what Papa Bench has done. Like they go down the community to the villages to like sensitize people. So people need to get an appreciation of what epilepsy is and at least know if I, if, I, if I have someone with epilepsy at my home, then what next, you know? So they should be sensitized on epilepsy and also give a knowledge on how they can help, you know? Because if you just tell them about epilepsy and that's all, so I don't know, uh -huh, so where do I go? But if you tell them about epilepsy, how you can be of help, how the, the end result is always good, it can actually influence my mind to actually you not know, pick interest in it. You know, I could maybe remember, oh, maybe I have a relative who was the, who was who was ABC. Oh, I think I have a sibling who was ABC. So that will not happen unless a person gets to you know to know more about the epilepsy. So you uh, being a media personality, I think what you're doing is already one of the things to get the information to the to the communities. I think there's <laughs> misinformation about epilepsy out there than there is actually information. I think for the longest time growing up, what I knew about somebody who has a seizure, what I, we, I think I, I don't even know where I had it. What I knew that should be done was put a spoon between their teeth. And then it turns out that's actually very dangerous. So we, and then uh, there's a lot of thinking that epilepsy is related to witchcraft, which, you know, we've talked about before. So there's more misinformation than there is information. Nina, if you would just care to, to debunk some of the myths that are out there and just you know, give us a few um, quick pointers on what actually is the truth about epilepsy. And misconceptions are quite many. But before I actually um, come to that, I wanted to add something to um, what Morris was saying when you talked about um, what we can do to, you know, have, to be talking about epilepsy a little more. And one of the things that I'd like to inform you all about is the fact that um, at some point last year, the WHO passed a resolution looking at epilepsy from a global perspective. So it is now going to be epilepsy and other neurological conditions. And what this does is give the opportunity to encourage member states to provide a multi-sectoral approach towards epilepsy. And what this also means is that it will aim at achieving a health, health equity. So I think 
that in itself will give us the opportunity to be talking about epilepsy on a broader spectrum than we have been trying to do on a local level. And the myths and misconceptions? And when it comes down to the myths and misconceptions, yes, you mentioned the spoon and the spoon has been a very big issue for many people. Nothing should be placed in the mouth of a person who is having a seizure because they are bound to swallow it or it's bound to cause a lot of injury. If you put a spoon in someone's mouth, they're bound to lose their teeth because the energy that might be used when that seizure is happening might be excessive. One of the other things that I had that was also quite interesting was that people who have seizures are not supposed to be eating eggs. <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, that was probably said by someone who did not want to share those eggs with the rest of the people <laughs> in the home. The other myths and misconceptions though are that a person who has epilepsy is contagious or that epilepsy in itself is contagious. It's a non-communicable disease. And I think it's very important for people to know that if people with seizures are to get support in any way. All right, thank you, Nina. Uh, Maurice, are there any misconceptions you want to share with us? Um, or in, in closing, maybe you'd give us a message that you want us to take home from this conversation. Okay, uh, as far as uh, the myths are concerned, you've uh, made mention of them. And I also think every community has their own way or have, has, every community has had their own way of, uh, of interpreting epilepsy. And true, right from childhood, there are different things that we hear about, about this condition. Uh, my side, I think it was basically the whole aspect of witchcraft. That was uh, what, uh, what I grew up knowing, you know. But of course, with exposure, you get to know the right information. And that brings with the fact that much as we say, the community needs to be sensitized, but with the right information. You know, If these people get to know uh, the right information, it will at least challenge their old beliefs about the, the, the condition and probably change also the approach to it. Now, as we, as we conclude this, I think one thing that I would just say is we need not to uh, segregate the people who are having epilepsy. We need to take them uh, as they are because they're actually productive people. You know, they can, they can work, they can uh, run families, you know, but if we segregate them, we deny them chance to live a normal life. And that will definitely have an impact on their, on their mental well-being, exposing them to all these other disorders I was talking about, depression being uh, the highest, you know? So we need to embrace them. They need to develop a sense of belonging in the community and that will also help them in coming out, you know? And they should be actually the champions to, to, to take this information back to the community, you know? Because if sometimes an outside person maybe just talks about it, they can be like, but we even don't know what it is. But if someone who has made peace with the, with the, with the condition goes back to the community and talks about it, it will facilitate more behavioral change among community members. Thank you very much, Maurice. Um, Nina, in closing, where is help, especially in this period where people cannot easily access um, maybe medical facilities because you know the journey is entailed? If I'm, I don't know how easy it is for you to work with your documents and try to explain this to you know, um, when, when you're stopped and they're asking where you're going and you're saying, I'm, I'm going to look for, you know, drugs for, for epilepsy. It doesn't look like you're sick at the moment, but, you know, so where is help for people who are in their homes, um, have epilepsy and need the support, both mental health support and also the actual drugs for, for it? I think the help um, that we're actually talking about is within organizations that are working in the epilepsy space, but in collaboration with the government as well. Because at the moment, like you've mentioned, it's not the easiest thing for someone to go and get and receive their medication. But I think it's important at a time like this, when we're talking about um, coming up with the uh, groups, different groups to support people living with epilepsy, that when we are putting restrictions like this together, we should have people who have conditions of this kind 
on tasks uh, on task forces that are being put together so that there is consideration for how chronic the condition is but also what needs to be done about it but i think one of the other things that i would really like to um, pinpoint is what maurice talked about people who are championing the condition and i think josephine you would probably be happy to know that as we speak right now i had told you that i'm the i was the 2019 golden light award winner for the international bureau for epilepsy but now 2021 the purple bench has actually gotten its first um, golden light award winner and that's a young lady who is within Masaka called Nabu Kenya Sophie who is making us absolutely proud she's taken it on she's written her story and now she's using it to be there and support others who have it I, I mean I think you're doing an amazing job Nina when when we started out I remember what it was like um, listening to you the first time and even in conversations after that just trying to get support for people who reached out and needed support and for a society that still thinks this is um, witchcraft or you know it's whatever it is it's it's a lot that you've done to just get the word out there and to just get them together in a group where people actually know that they're not alone so I want to say thank you very much to you Nina for the work that you're doing with the Papa Bench and also to you Maurice for agreeing to join this conversation but giving the mental health support um, to the Papa Bench initiative and to to the university students and everybody else who needs it thank you both for taking the time to join us for this conversation I appreciate your time and that brings us to the end of our discussion for tonight Coming up is NTV Open Edition.